me. I can't hear you. Do it. The fire police for ambulance. Oh, my God. Ten kids on board. Who do you want to speak to? The fire police for ambulance. Police for ambulance. My husband's just been shot. It's one of Scotland's most notorious unsolved murders. My last and my only memory is uh, of my dad on the floor in a pool with his own blood. We know that someone out there knows. And look what it's doing to a family. Look at the damage that it's done. Two sons growing up without a dad. Ten days in, finding the gun. Thought that was it, going to be solved. Nearly two decades after the murder of Alistair Wilson, could police be closer to catching his killer? The 28th of November, 2004, Nairn, a quiet seaside town in the Scottish Highlands. Lindsay Gardner was having a meal with her friend in the Havelock Hotel, just metres from the Wilson family home. It was quite busy that night, yeah, there was quite a lot of people. Sunday evening, out for Sunday dinner, yeah. And what was the atmosphere like? Um, just lots of chatter. The music, the jukebox was on, music was playing. Um, a few people having drinks at the bar. Across the road, Alistair Wilson was reading his two sons a bedtime story when the doorbell rang. I ran downstairs, we were expecting other friends around that evening, and um, I, I didn't recognise, you know, it was somebody I didn't know, but he asked for Alistair. So I just thought nothing off it. There was, you know, I ran back upstairs and told Al that there was somebody at the door asking for him and took over reading stories to the boys. Alistair spoke to the man, closed the front door, went back upstairs to Veronica and the boys. He was carrying a blue envelope with the name Paul written on it. What can you tell us about this envelope? Well, Alistair came back upstairs with the envelope and, as you know, had Paul on it, so he was just a bit bewildered um, as to what the gentleman had said because the envelope wasn't addressed to him. Um, and I said, no, he definitely asked for you by name. It wasn't addressed to himself and that there was nothing in the envelope. Um, he found that quite strange um, and just said, you go back downstairs and see if the gentleman was still there. Alistair opened the front door again. The man was still there. Veronica heard loud bangs. She said it sounded like wooden pallets being dropped. I just left the boys in the room and I, I ran down, didn't say anything, I just, I just ran down and then he was lying in, in the porch. It was obvious, it was so serious. There was just so much blood. Alistair had been shot in the face and the body. I'm just looking at Al, thinking, I, I just, I didn't know what to do. And I just, I, I can't do this, I can't, you know, this is, this is my husband we're talking about, and I can't, I can't help him. I just, I, I don't know what to do, so I ran across the road to the hotel, I just screamed to them that I, I need help. Mrs Wilson burst through the door, please help, please help, my husband's just been shot, and... Myself and my friend just looked at each other almost in, like, disbelief. Like, did we hear what we thought we'd just heard? And just got up and ran out to try and help. And um, just so happened that we were the first ones to arrive at the door um, to see Alistair lying there in the doorway. He was just fighting for his life, really. It was his face I noticed first. As just his cheek was puffed out um, and he was struggling to breathe and, yeah. So he was conscious at that time? He was still conscious, yeah. Yeah, he was still conscious. 
they weren't the only people on the scene. The owner of the Havelock Hotel rushed to the doorstep from a bar just down the road. His name's Andy Burnett. He no longer lives in Scotland. But a year after the murder, he gave a detailed account of what happened that night to a Sunday Times journalist. He said that uh, he went up the steps, he saw that Alastair was lying on the ground, and uh, he also described seeing a bullet hole just beneath his cheek. He said that there was a, a, another woman there, and he said that she, in his words, I think, were, were, she was doing everything but putting her fingers in the bullet holes to stop the blood, but she was doing everything she could to try and save Alastair. We had the paramedics on the other side of the phone telling us what we should be doing. I remember seeing a cartridge of a bullet lying on his sort of chest, sort of stomach sort of area. I can remember sort of pushing up his shirt to see if I could, if there was any bullet wounds to help stop the bleeding. And Veronica was there and it seemed to Andy Burnett that she was in shock. And he, he's, he described how he kind of got hold of her and made her, made her look at him. And he said, what happened? And she said, this really weird guy came to the door. Could you see inside the house? Yeah. Um, so I remember at one point looking up uh, to see a little boy standing at the bottom of the stairs and trying to ask anybody that was about to try and, you know, um, take, take the little boy into another room. You don't want a little boy to see what, what you're looking at. The, in the doorway, it says, Dad. That little boy was Andrew Wilson. Here he is with his dad on the day of the murder. Andrew can't remember that walk in the woods, but what he saw later that night is etched on his mind forever. The only memory that I've got of my dad is the image of him lying on the doorstep in his own blood. So there's happy memories. I mean, you go through the photos and stuff. It's just, I don't have any of those memories. They're all other people. And I was four, my brother was two. My brother's got even less memories than me. Andy Burnett, the owner of the Havelock, told the Sunday Times he initially thought the shooting had been inside his pub. When he ran over, he realised it was across the road. He said more or less that he was being nosy, really. I mean, obviously he was concerned. He knew them as a couple. He described how he had uh, played golf once with uh, Alastair. And he described how uh, eventually the, uh, the body was being taken away. I can remember standing at the front door, um, just looking out into the dark night. Um, and then all of a sudden just thinking, I just sort of come to realisation that there was somebody out there with a gun and that uh, so I was probably standing in full, full view. Alistair was pronounced dead in hospital. Two boys, aged two and four, left without their dad, Veronica without her husband. There was a huge manhunt for the killer. Alistair Wilson's murder remains a mystery. The description of the gunman's been circulated widely in the Inverness area, but it's not rung a bell with anybody locally. Think again, could it be a local man? Perhaps a customer of Mr Wilson in the Bank of Scotland in Inverness. He's late 30s, short and stocky, maybe around five foot four, maybe a bit taller. He had short, dark hair, but was wearing a black baseball cap, dark jeans and a black bomber jacket. The shooting happened in the small town of Nairn in the Scottish Highlands, not a place you'd expect a gangland-style murder. The last killing here was in the 1980s after a fight at a wedding reception. The Wilsons had moved to Nairn 18 months before. They'd fallen in love with its beautiful beaches and wanted to raise their children here. Alistair was a manager at the Bank of Scotland in nearby Inverness, and Veronica had been a graphic designer. They'd had a whirlwind romance. He was 
one of those people you met, you just knew. And then, um, yeah, it's um, all happened very fast. Yeah, oh, sounds like love at first sight. Uh, he was um, just, when he said he'd be there at 8 o'clock, he was there at 8 o'clock with a bunch of flowers on time. And um, it was all very nice that having somebody who just instantly cared so much, um, very genuine and honest. And uh, yeah, it quickly um, moved on. Within six weeks, we were engaged. Um, wow. Yes, so it's it was, um, yeah, just knew straight away. When he wasn't at work, it was just all about the boys. He was very hands-on. Alistair had two weeks left of his job at the bank when he was murdered. He wasn't enjoying it anymore. The, the challenge wasn't there. With any big organisation, the rules change and circumstances change and he wasn't doing what he'd set out to do, helping other people more and more. You know, he couldn't. It, it didn't fit into the rules now of the bank. Nine days into the police investigation, there was a breakthrough when a council worker made an important discovery. We'd gone up to the drain, we were cleaning around the boot, and uh, there was a gun just sitting at the bottom of the drain. Well, we thought it was a toy, because of the size of it, and just being down the drain, you know, I thought it was somebody playing a sick joke, which is what had happened. But then once we lifted it out, I felt the weight of the, the gun and found, I realised it was real. The gun that killed Alistair was found half a mile from the Wilson family home. It wasn't a weapon you'd expect to be used in a murder. It's a Heinel Shoe Model 1 pocket pistol built in the 1920s or 1930s in the Czech Republic. As you'll see from it in the size of my hand, and when I put it, my hand around the grip, you only actually get one finger around the grip of the, the pistol. It's extremely small. Ten days in, finding the gun the first time was just... It's... I thought that was amazing, that was it. We have, you know, this is it, we're going to be solved. But no DNA was found on the gun, a hammer blow for the family and the police investigation. And the blue envelope that Alistair had carried back downstairs has never been found. This is the, the best match, the best likeness of the envelope that was handed to Alistair Wilson on the 28th November 2004, shortly before he was shot. A couple of interesting facts. One, the name Paul was on this envelope. And secondly, when he's gone upstairs to his wife, he's, the envelope is open and there's nothing inside. What was the purpose of the envelope? And who is Paul? Just two of the many mysteries in this case. The years passed, but the police were no closer to finding answers to those questions. Alistair's life was under the spotlight. Our life's been looked into in every fine detail over and over again with all the different teams we've had. Yeah. I don't think there's anything that hasn't been touched. Veronica and her two boys stayed in Nairn after the murder. In fact, they continued to live in the same house where Alistair had been shot. Veronica had to put up with gossip and whispers. A suspicion fell on her too, despite police being clear she's not a suspect. What is it like knowing that people are judgmental, knowing that people will probably hang on every word you say and look for clues mm -hmm. of whether you're guilty or not? It is really difficult. You do feel a lot of time you're not living your own life because, yes, you have to be careful what you say. I to say I have information that other people might not know. I always try and put myself in their position and what would I think if I read about us. And I do believe people, to be able to sleep at night, have to think that there was something there. But it just makes our life very uncomfortable. We exist, we don't have... We don't live the way that we should do. There have been countless theories about Alistair's murder, that it was related to his work in the bank, 
that its brutality suggested it was the work of a hitman or that there was Irish paramilitary involvement. Police have investigated all of these, but they've drawn a blank on a motive. Until now. Remember the Havelock, the pub where Veronica ran for help in the minutes after Alistair was shot? Well, back in 2004, it had been taken over by Andy Burnett. He was 37 at the time. His LinkedIn profile says he's ex-army, a diplomatic courier posted to Germany for five years in the 1990s. Andy Burnett installed decking and a new seating area at the Havelock in May of 2004, just in time for the summer. He applied for planning permission later. There was a call for any objections from neighbours. Alistair wasn't happy and wrote a letter. Here's a section of it. The decking has been used for the serving of food and drink whenever the pub is open. This has included late nights with bar doors open and consequent noise and disturbance. Beer glasses have been found in garden areas and broken glass strewn in the street. During the summer, I and my family felt uncomfortable using our front door and even looking out our front windows as we frequently had customers staring directly back at us. Now that last line is interesting because Andy Burnett told the Sunday Times in 2005 that Alistair and Veronica had begun keeping their curtains closed. Yeah, I thought this was interesting that the suggestion from Andy Burnett was that there was something a little off-key about the couple that he'd said two weeks before the shooting why is their front door never open? And why are the curtains always closed? It's like they've got something to hide. Or maybe the curtains were shut, as Alistair's letter says, because people at the pub were staring right in their front windows. The council sent Alistair's letter to the Havelock two days before his murder. And the police now believe it's significant. For the first time, they have a possible motive. We believe the most likely motive, based on what was a current grievance in Alistair's life at the time of his murder, was the fact that he had objected in writing about uh, a large decking area that had been built in the pub car park directly opposite where he stayed. We know that that knowledge of Alistair's name was shared with others in amongst the pub at that time. So that, after 18 years, is what we believe to be the most likely grievance that might result in somebody coming into conflict with Alistair at the time of his murder. Could the reason for this gangland-style assassination really be a dispute over a pub decking area? Andy Burnett's no longer living in Nairn. He sold the Havelock and moved to Canada in 2013. Detectives travelled to Nova Scotia and interviewed him over the course of four days. We tried to speak to him too, but he either didn't receive our messages or didn't want to respond. For the first time in years, there's been a flurry of activity around the case. But police knew about the decking dispute when Alistair was killed. Andy Burnett also told the Sunday Times that he'd been a focus of the police inquiry a big issue for the police and everybody else in Nairn is that on the Saturday I got letter from council complaining about decking and saying Crescent Road, predominantly a family street. Then on the Sunday he got shot and that was me being interrogated and investigated. Even went to Guernsey and spoke to my golfing partner, he means the police, even went to Guernsey and spoke to his golfing partner, asking him if I got angry and things like that. The police have emphasised that Andy Burnett is a witness, not a suspect. So what's new about the decking dispute? Well, we now know it was the subject of discussion in the Havelock in the days before Alistair's death. And we know that police are now interested in a specific person. Someone we've not heard about before. We can't name this man for legal reasons. 
What we can see is that he lived in Nairn at the time of the murder and worked for the emergency services. He's also linked to Andy Burnett on social media. I've come round the corner just so we don't identify his old address, but neighbours have said that he was a regular at the Havelock, and two of them mentioned that he kept guns in his house, in a locked gun safe, as he'd be required to do under a licence. When Alistair was murdered, police said the gunman was 30 to 40 years old. They've recently changed that age description. It's now 20 to 40. At the time of the murder, this man was 20. Someone who knew him told us he was a decent guy and certainly wasn't stocky, which was also a key part of the description of the killer. As we approach the anniversary of Alistair's death, no one has been charged. It's left a family scarred. I've been referred to as the banker's son. I've had people in school say not very nice things about it and think that it's funny. And I just think people don't realise the effects of something like this. I've, I, I, over 10 years of counselling on many fears, many fears of the dark, loud noises being on my own. I don't think I'll ever get over it or understand it, but I can live with, live with what happened. Well, I have to live with what happened. Are police now closing in on the answers the Wilson family so desperately need? It's hard to grasp what you're actually looking for as an answer because I don't know why people kill other people. It's, you know, and, and a, with a gun on the family doorstep while the children are upstairs, I don't know what sort of person I'm trying to find. For us as a family, yeah, we need, we need to know why. This is just so senseless, you know. A who and why would just make such a difference to us being able to move on.